it's uh, it's amazing to see the the change uh, that he's made in his uh, his life. Uh, it's, I just can't believe. Uh, some of the things he tells me uh, that he used to do when he was a younger kid, and and to see him now, I just uh, I can't even picture it. You you didn't know him back in those days. No, I didn't. But uh, you know, after a period of time, uh, he uh, he started to relay some of the stories uh, to me about himself when he was in uh, uh, well when he was little and through high school and the problems he had, and uh, it's it's really uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, uh, for him to be able to come this far and uh, I mean the odds of making it uh, as a professional baseball player are uh, astronomical and and then to uh, to grow up the way he did and to overcome uh, all the problems he had and uh, uh, and to make it to uh, to the to the level uh, that he's made it in this this game uh, today is just uh, just amazing story Steve Lombardozzi talks about his friend Greg Gagne's problems with alcohol and other drugs. Then, Twins teammate Gary Gaetti praises Gagne's battle against alcoholism and drug abuse during his teen years. Um, I don't know all there is to know about Greg Gagne, but it takes a lot of guts to be able to admit that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has certainly uh, done well for himself being under those circumstances at that, at that age. and uh, and. Uh, He's through determination and and uh, hard work. He's really made a name for himself, and he's earned the respect of uh, myself and all of our teammates. Greg Gagne, an amazing story of how a teenage troublemaker kicked off teams in high school by coaches who grew tired of his failures, toughed it out, and became a respected member of the world champion Minnesota Twins. Greg Gagne, one of the hottest shortstops in 1987 and as a teenager, almost threw it all away for booze and other drugs. River Park of South Dakota proudly presents the Greg Gagne story. As his sobriety continues, the contest isn't over in a ball game until the last out of the last inning. Just as the rally against addiction has to go on and on through a person's life. For Greg Gagne of the Minnesota Twins, the rally continues as he appreciates more every day that it's great to be alive. Greg, when, as you look back, did uh, your involvement with the uh, use of uh, mood-altering chemicals uh, really begin? Can you recall the first incident that you had? Well, I think um, probably when I was maybe 11 or 12, I would, I would be drinking. Uh, and I just, you know, any way I could get it, uh, I try to try to get it. So at that age, um, that's when I started, and it was more or less because I didn't think that anybody cared or loved me, and I just wanted freedom to do whatever I wanted to do, and that's what I kind of turned to. So as you look back, you feel that uh, that you were using the chemicals pretty early on to handle some of the stresses of life that you yeah, were kind of a, yeah to maybe make me feel good or something, or just to not think about my problems. Uh, to make me laugh, to have fun. You grew up, in a, as I understand it, in a large family. Uh, nine children, is that? Yeah, well, it's nine, I guess, because I get some half-brothers and half-sisters, but uh, originally from a family of five. And, and where uh, in that five were you? Were you I was you? the second, second oldest second. and uh, the first son. I see. Okay. So I had two younger brothers and a younger sister and an older sister. The, uh, the, the disease of uh, chemical dependency, alcoholism, is very much a family situation. Uh, had there been any history in your family uh, back through the years uh, of uh, problems with, uh, well, with chemicals? Uh, not that I can recall, you know. I kind of, you know, I really looked at it as just um, a way to uh, cope with my problems or whatever. Um, you know, that's all as far as drinking and stuff like that. Uh, it was just kind of a cop-out or something just to make me feel good and get away from some of my problems. But my family history, no, I can't really recall anybody uh, being an alcoholic or stuff like that. But I know that, you know, this, uh, they drink, you know, they might, my grandfather, he have a beer or something every night, I don't know, with his dinner. But uh, I never really um, knew if anybody was an alcoholic, really. 
The progression then, you started out as many of us did, and I can remember my uh, first uh, first night out and waking up in the morning and swearing I'd never do it again, but I, of course, went back to doing it. But uh, uh, the progression then, did you, did you feel that uh, that your use increased as you went into high school? Was high school a difficult time? Well, I think in high school I kind of hung out with the wrong crowd. Um, these guys would hang out at, we call this place the pipe, and in the summer we just have to, uh, to have fun, we just wanted to get a six pack each night. And every, every night we try to go out and get a six pack and drink and, and uh, to have a fun time. So the pressure, I guess, was just being around the wrong group of kids, group of guys, and uh, just to have fun was drinking beers and making you feel like you were feeling good. You were one of the gang and you could and handle one of, things. Yeah, one yeah. of the gang and just, uh, you know, just having fun with that, you know. Well, we know the peer pressure on the young people today. In fact, in fact I think it's probably increasing uh, that they are subject to that kind of pressure and uh, they, want, they want to be part of the crowd, as we all do. So uh, when did you get introduced into other uh, uh, drugs and, and what were some of the other drugs that you were uh, that, uh, well, think, experimented with? Yeah, I think um, uh, there, there was hashish down the pipe, uh, marijuana, um, sometimes pills like acid, but I never tried acid, uh, mescaline, THC, speed, I tried those. Um, but basically, more or less, it was the marijuana and the hashish and the beers and drinking. Um, you know, it, 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 was, it was kind of a test to, to try these different drugs, too. Uh, and it was hard to get those. Um, but when we did, it was up to us if we wanted to try them. And I tried, uh, tried them once, but not... Uh, after trying them once, I said, that was enough, you know? I don't want to try it anymore. Because uh, it wasn't doing me any good. Um, so your your most common use, as I think probably today, is true with young people. Would have been alcohol. Yeah. Would it be the, the big drug? Would that be right? I well, for for alcohol, I think the kids can get it probably the easiest. Maybe mm -hmm. would be maybe alcohol, um, and then maybe marijuana. Uh, and now with crack, I don't know cocaine. It, that's a real tough. Yeah, it's a real tough drug, and and. Uh, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, and as I lived and I was in drugs and into alcohol and stuff like that for a purpose in life, you know, I just, I just try to keep my eyes focused on Jesus, and, and that's my life, and that's where I draw my strength from. And so, as this, as this progressed, then you, and in your career, uh, you, you moved right on pretty much to, despite uh, your involvement uh, with chemicals. So when when did you kind of when did it reach its kind of its uh, its end or its climax for you, Greg? I would say in uh, my first year in rookie ball, I was a 17-year-old kid. Uh, I get drafted by the Yankees in the fifth round, and I went to Paintsville, Kentucky. And uh, there was guys on the team who I roomed with who were still smoking and still drinking. And I said, I don't want to do this because I ain't going to be worth much out there on the field. I want to get the most out of my career and my abilities, and uh, I had to curtail that and cut it out. So that, was, that year was a time where I really thought about uh, really making a commitment to play baseball, you know, and stay away from the drugs. So that would have to be the, you know, the time where I had no interest in that stuff. So your focus became more on what you could do positively rather than what yeah. was happening on negatively. Baseball was more to take care of my body to play baseball as a career because I wanted to make sure I was giving it everything I had when I was out there on the field. And if I was smoking or drinking, then I felt that it wouldn't be giving it my best the next day. Greg, the, uh, and the young people that will be watching this, uh, and, uh, and you have a lot of fans, so I know that there will be a lot of people watching. Uh, uh, I think if we can help them understand what I'm hearing you say, that, that you found yourself in, I, I'm going to say probably a, a, a position of low self-esteem where you were somewhat lonely and, and wondered if you could cut it. Uh, yeah. Is that the areas that you were having troubles in I too? think, um, yeah, as far as um, I felt like uh, I wanted my freedom. I felt kind of lonely uh, that nobody really cared about me um, in my early years. I found out when I was 17 that my dad did care about me and I had a high school coach who cared about me. But I guess I was a little bit too immature to 
to really think that anybody cared about me. But there are people out there who care care about you, and if you know, uh, you might have a problem or whatever. But uh, there's people out there who care about you. But you wonder because you and, and you, as you were yeah. moving up the ladder, I'm sure you had times when you really wondered your self confidence. Perhaps was uh, low at times. Yeah, it's you know that's where I try to draw. Uh, I try to draw my strength from Jesus and from God. Um, because he puts everything in perspective and you know he loves me and I know he loves me and he cares about me and um, he's making me into the person he wants me to be so I have to just trust in him and just follow his ways. And You've been searching probably for something that was missing in your life. Then. Yeah I was searching for something I guess um, you know I knew I want to play baseball but something else was still still missing and uh, you know, I, I was trying a little bit of yoga and stuff like that too, but uh, that's the main thing, you know, that's what I say he, is he found me. I wasn't really looking for him, but he found me. So with that, those powers in your life, you've been able to, uh, to go on from then to, uh, so that you, are, you don't really have any uh, desire for any of the chemicals. No, not as much in the past. I mean, in the past, you know, I used to swear like crazy. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because... Uh, he just took it out of my life. I don't have any... I remember one year after I went home, after a year playing in Greensboro, I went home and me and my brother were just playing basketball and we got into an argument and I cussed him out and I said, who's that, you know? I said, I didn't, you know, it didn't even sound like me, you know? And, uh, you know, sometimes I do slip like that, but it sounded really funny when I did that. And that's just with everything else, you know, my desires for alcohol and, uh, and, marijuana stuff it's it's really gone and um, to me it's you know the, the desire is not there and uh, it's just gonna harm you you know that's the way I look at it too. Today uh, our young people I think Greg probably are under a faster world and more pressure and we know that the incidence of, of uh, problems associated with chemicals are increasing and, I, and particularly I think alcohol and all the other drugs are coming along rapidly too and there's a lot of ideas of what we can do or should do, uh, need to do. I know that uh, frequently in our area there are auto wrecks where people or young kids are killed and uh, something has to be done. But those young people need to, they look up to someone like you as, as a role model. What would be your advice you know, to some of the people who be listening now? How can they structure their lives so they don't get into the alcohol drug scene? Well, if they... I think, first of all, the alcohol and the drugs, I look at it as uh, it's going to affect your body. And, you know, you don't have to feel good to uh, put drugs and stuff in your body. Uh, rather, work out, uh, get in shape, do that type of deal. What about the self-image thing? Uh, uh, self you, you feel pretty good about I, well, yourself now, don't you? You seem to uh, have a good yeah. self-image now. I, I, you know, I have a pretty good self-image. Last year, we won the World Series. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, they had a great Gagney day for me back home. And uh, that was just really touching to me because I didn't know how many lives I affected by just playing a game of baseball. But these people from a veteran's home, these people who were handicapped, older people, uh, they gave me an award for... I guess uh, for giving them joy to see me play baseball and enthusiasm. And to me, that was just a blessing because sure. to see that I touch somebody like that, mm -hmm. is, uh, it's really great. Well, that's the program uh, you know, of, of, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, in the 12 Steps, that the more we give away, the more we get. And I, I think that we that have been through some of this uh, know that. What would be the biggest regret of your life? Probably the biggest regret was maybe when I got played in high school and I was into the drugs and the drinking. I think it ruined a lot of my athletic ability during those years. Um, I would have liked to see without that, the drugs and drinking, how much of an athlete I would have been through high school because I was thrown off teams. I quit baseball, got thrown off basketball and quit football. Uh, a lot of times, you, and you miss those memories too with those guys back uh, uh, in high school. So that was a big, 
also thing that I regret. By that, you're illustrating that you can overcome that because today, despite those losses, you're a uh, you're a star. You're yeah. a good role model and an inspiration to people. So uh, you can come back. I guess yeah, it's a message. Yeah, it can. It can. You know, I, like uh, you know, I, I think the old man is gone. But the new the new man is here. You know. I think old, that's right. Born again to the new. To the new. Yeah. That's exactly right. What would be uh, one of the highlights of your, on the career side, uh, one of the outstanding uh, things, experiences you had in your oh. in baseball? <laughs> ah, jeez. I don't know. I guess that one that sticks out uh, pretty good right now is probably that game-winning hit in the World Series Game Seven. Uh, just with the base load, I just got enough of it to get it down there and uh, to put us ahead, and it kept us ahead. That's the one that. Uh, comes out the most and to be in a championship team you know being a World Series championship team with the Twins that's, that's kind of a big satisfaction uh, to know uh, that perhaps you I hope you know that uh, so many of your uh, fellow players and, and the people in the organization think so highly of you that uh, and you know your peers when they think yeah. well of you that's that's a pretty good sign yeah but, you know you always try to be accepted I guess by your that's peers right. and you want to feel respected too but uh, Personally, in addition to that, then in your in your non career life, what would you say is the most uh, exciting thing that's happened to you? My non career? Well, I got married uh, two years ago, and I have a son who's eight months old right now, Zachary, and uh, he's something. He's uh, you know he's just he's a beautiful kid, and he's always putting everything in his mouth, though. You know, <laughs> he's, everything's in his mouth. He's growing teeth now, but uh, I don't know. I really love him, and and uh, you know I. Every day is a new adventure, and see him grow up. I just hope that I can. I want to bring him up in, in a good, a good Christian home, and uh, bring him up with uh, godly values and godly principles. Well, the joy, that joy, I'll tell you, uh, isn't that though? Oh, and, uh, I used to think grandparents were really flaky, and I still think so. Yeah. But now I am one, so yeah, <laughs> it, it really is, and uh, it's something. It's, and it's a source of real. It's worth the effort. Yeah. And, uh, and these days, uh, people need, young people need a role model, and you're one of those, Greg, and uh, I, we, I just know you'll keep on uh, helping you. where you can, and, and by the way you live, uh, being an inspiration to others. Thank you. We thank you much for being uh, here today. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Greg Gagne didn't have too much praise for himself. He's really a modest, quiet person. No attitude of, look what a great guy I am. But as I asked his teammates more about him, it became clear that here was a tremendous person, a man responsible for a great deal of the Twins' success in 1987, a well-liked teammate. What kind of guy is he? Well, Greg's a, a, a real quiet guy. Uh, I think early when he was younger, he was a, pretty much a, a go get him type of guy when he was in high school and stuff. He seemed like, I guess, apparently was real wild and outgoing type of guy. But um, ever since he made it to the major leagues, before the major leagues, he became a a real quiet guy and, and goes about doing his business. He's the, probably the hardest working guy in the ball club as far as taking ground balls is concerned. He's out there taking ground balls all the time. We're always working hard to try to improve his fielding skills and, and uh, also his hitting skills. Attitude-wise, how does he get to, uh, oh, to direct? He's a, he's a great guy. He's Greg, uh, he's quiet. Uh, only last year, I thought during the uh, playoffs and World Series and uh, maybe the last month of the season, he started to loosen up a little bit, but he's always been quiet. And, uh, of course, we all know he had a tough time in his childhood years growing up. So uh, he's an outstanding person, and, and uh, he's a real pleasure to have on the ball club. Uh, and he plays hard each day. He gives you a real good effort, and as a manager, that's what you're looking for. You play right alongside of Greg. Uh, what kind of a guy is he to play with? Greg is a class individual. He is. He's a very dedicated person and uh, very honest and straightforward. Just your basic good guy. Just a good yeah. guy. Just your basic good guy. Somehow that makes it all seem too easy because basic good guys aren't born. They come from suffering and hard work and application of the old-fashioned guts principle. Greg Gagne had it just as tough as the young people in our schools around the area today. Maybe tougher. He was part of the wrong crowd. He tried all the strong stuff but it didn't make a loser out of him. He gave his alcohol and drug problem the hard work and determination it needed and beat it. River Park has a real faith in the strength of our students and their ability to handle themselves on the drug scene as well as Greg Gagne did.
You know, peer pressure has got to be hard, and uh, it seems like a lot of the uh, adverse things that kids have to go through, like uh, drugs and alcohol and and uh, whether smoking, whatever, uh, seems to be reaching them at a younger age. And like I said, I haven't reached that that uh, area in my life yet, but. Uh, I hope that that's something I can approach with an open mind and, and, and a lot of knowledge about and be able to help through my experiences, help my children not make the same mistakes. As the conversation with the twins came to an end, I was reminded of the many sports stars who had spoken up through the years against alcohol and other drugs. Celebrities who went on record for River Park, who put their popularity and reputation on the line to help others. There was Fran Tarkington, quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings, an exciting football star, going on to be a game show host and popular television personality. He didn't have an addiction problem himself, but worked hard to help those friends and family members who did. And there was Carl Eller, former Purple People Eater of the Minnesota Vikings, number 81, star of four Super Bowls, and now drug consultant for the NFL, and an admitted junkie. Big, strong, successful, intelligent, healthy. Uh, what happened to change all that, Carl? Well, I think the common denominator uh, through all that, Glenn, was uh, simply the fact that I got involved with chemicals at uh, an early point in my life. And uh, by the time I'd reached the peak of success, uh, so had I uh, reached the, uh, the height of uh, being dependent on chemicals. So it started early and progressed and uh, I think the point, one of the points there is that our viewers of this program, some of them, are, and probably a good, a good percentage of them, are still going to have the concept that so long as a person is functioning, in effect doing their job, and probably still doing it fairly well, that they can't have any problem with chemicals. And yet, how long were you doing your job and performing well, and yet you were having a problem with chemicals? I think I uh, did my job and maintained uh, you know, the, the reputation for doing my job well for most of my career. Eventually it caught up with me, but it was at the tail end of my career. And I think there wasn't any uh, uh, performance uh, indications about my having a problem until really later in my career. Uh, there were other incidents, and they were isolated, uh, uh, but I did not really look at them as uh, being caused by my, my chemical use. But during that time, you were involved with the chemicals, and, uh, and perhaps there was an earlier time that had you gotten help, it would have, uh, it would have been beneficial. Oh, no question about it. Uh, I think I could go back uh, at any point on my drinking career, and it, uh, it would have been very beneficial for me. And Rosie Greer, another gentle giant of a man, a vicious contender on the football field, but a real gentleman otherwise. Rosie is now working with the street kids in downtown L.A., trying to keep them off drugs. There was Don Newcomb. Baseball fans will remember him with no trouble at all. Don, I, I just uh, am overjoyed that uh, we had this opportunity to visit, and I hope that we do again. Uh, anything you'd like to finally say to the people who are going to be watching this? Well, what I'd like to say is to the young people, if there's any young people out there that might be watching your show, I would like to tell them that if they decide they're going to drink, they ought to find out something about alcohol and what it can do to their system. Because here I am now, an ex-athlete and an alcoholic also, and I, I don't say ex-alcoholic, I'm still an alcoholic, although I have not had anything to drink in 10 years. I tell you that you need to find out something about alcohol and what it does to you. And maybe you are one of those people that cannot drink or cannot drink large amounts of alcohol. So it's very important, I think, to find out something about your own system. I also had a conversation with Bob Welch pitching for the Oakland Athletics in 1988. He's made an outstanding name for himself since he almost traded his baseball career for alcohol back 10 years or so. What about in the stadium itself or, or around the games? Uh, a lot of things associated with, with uh, my attitude towards you know, training or the way I show up to a ballpark sometimes. You, you ever know, come to a ball game in the, in the majors uh, intoxicated? Oh yeah, I come to the ballpark one time in San Francisco at the end of the season in 1979, uh, you know, totally smashed, embarrassing myself, getting on the team bus, you know, cussing at whoever was in the way, uh, cussing at my manager, you know, having confrontations with teammates, starting fights with other guys on other team, just totally embarrassing myself, you know, and at the time, 
I really didn't care, you know, I didn't pay any attention to it. I was too drunk. Uh, throwing some ashtrays off the top of floors, you know, 60 floors up in San Francisco, you know, mm -hmm. firing them at somebody and things like that. Just doing a lot of crazy things along the way. Uh, and not taking care of myself, I think, you know, self-destruction along the way. At, uh, it's been abusing. said that alcoholism is a form, well, it's obviously it's a form of suicide. If we oh, keep yeah. on going, it, it will self-destruct. Yeah, especially now when you get in, involved with, with uh, the youth and, and some of the people in the facilities, and, and you take a look at the way people appear after 40 and 50 years of drinking, you know, you just see that it just... Just slowly, really deteriorates. You know, just slowly yeah. deteriorates the face and the body, and you know you can just take a peek at somebody and say, you know, that, I bet 90% of this gentleman here has a has an alcohol problem. And so went the interviews with some of the sports greats who talked about chemical dependency on previous "It's Great to Be Alive" shows for River Park. They all seem to have the same thought: they regret their actions in their youth. They know now that if you want to be healthy, you just can't do drinking and drugs. These strong young bodies and quick minds with their beautiful sense of humor and bright dreams of the future, they can go on to become successes in the business world, recognize celebrities in the communications field, life-saving giants of medicine with creative technology, literary geniuses lighting up the minds of all around them, or theological guardians bringing us all closer to our promised future life or they can end up here with burned out brains and spent bodies. There's much talk about America's youth having a weak set of values, of choosing role models from sleazy television and home video shows. While they couldn't find a more admirable set of heroes than these athletes who almost lost their chance at celebrity through alcohol and other drugs, and they came back to win it all the hard way. River Park salutes them and offers them as models of excellent lifestyles. The hardworking, the dedicated man of sports, clean and sober, a living standard for youth to imitate. Their success and their return to health after a fall into the pit of chemical dependency proves what River Park has been saying all along. When your rally continues, it's great to be alive.